All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we thought it would be fun to uh, kind of talk about the, the homebrew spirit um, and designing homebrew recipes, looking at historical recipes to celebrate National Beer Day. Um, we want to keep this pretty interactive. So if you guys have um, different questions or comments, feel free to use the Q&A function um, and we will get to them as quickly as possible. My name is Eric. I'm the education manager at White Labs. Um, you guys want to go through and introduce yourselves? Sure, I'll jump in. My name is uh, Joanne Curley Stevenson. I'm the head of business development who kind of in the background spurned this program. Um, since it's National Beer Day and we all can't get together in person, we felt it was really important um, to do a virtual beer day and a virtual cheers and outreach to Ian through social media and got Ian to get involved with this project with our brewer Richard in Asheville. So Richard and, uh, Richard and Ian, I'd like you guys to introduce yourselves. Oh, yeah, um, I guess I'll go first. So I'm Richard Marasini. Um, I do quality for White Labs Asheville and also um, take charge of the brewing skid that we have in Asheville. So we have a small three barrel system. Um, we do a lot of fun R&D brewing and just kind of play around for our uh, kitchen and tap here in Asheville. Um, and yeah, so when Joanne reached out to me, definitely wanted to hop on and collaborate and get a, a recipe that everybody could kind of join in and play around with and have some fun for National Beer Day, even though we're all locked inside. So uh, yeah, Ian, if you want to take it away. Sure. Uh, do I need to put something or can... You're good. Okay, great. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Ian Bacon. I am an intervention specialist, a teacher by day, and occasionally a brewer by day. I'm also a professional brewer at Bad Tom Smith uh, here in Cleveland, but we have our main branch down in Cincinnati, Ohio. And so it's a two barrel system there. Uh, we've got a few different fun things on tap. I try and do stuff that's traditional, but with a twist. Um, and uh, that's kind of what we did here. Uh, it's a traditional historical pre-prohibition porter uh, that Richard and I came up with. And um, I hope others are brewing it too. Richard, do you want to talk a little bit about how you guys came up with the recipe and, you know, when you first got together, like, you know, what your thought process was? Yeah, for sure. Um, so obviously, National Beer Day um, is the, the day that um, prohibition was repealed. Um, so we wanted to go with a pre-prohibition style um, beer. Uh, the BJCP recognizes two different styles, a pre-prohibition lager and a pre-prohibition porter. Um, so obviously, right out of the gate, we wanted to make sure that fermentation temps were going to be accessible to anybody who wanted to brew. Um, so that kind of ruled out a lager for us. So we decided to go the route of the porter. Um, and Ian had some great suggestions with historical um, beer styles that actually came from uh, George Washington's journal. Um, I believe it was the Smithsonian, Ian, correct me if I'm wrong on that, um, has his journal. So that was a, a recipe that was basically developed um, for drinkable water uh, when he was still a general. I believe it was somewhere in Virginia um, when this was first made. Um, and so kind of playing around with that idea, really that recipe is just uh, molasses and six row. So we wanted to make it a little bit more fun. Obviously something that people are gonna wanna drink once they're done uh, with fermentation. So we put a little bit of a twist on it, made sure that you know we had some good flavors coming in, but we stuck to that pre-prohibition porter style, which is really kind of a still flavorful, but more tame uh, take on a porter. Um, the BJCP basically defines it as less hoppy than an American porter and less caramely and malty than an English porter. So kind of still, still some flavors popping out, but a little bit more tame and mild than compared to a lot of the other porters you might get um, nowadays. What, what yeast strain did you guys uh, select for this beer? So we have decided to uh, suggest O29, so our German ale Kolsch yeast, um, and that is to kind of stick more in line with a little bit more of like being able to get a lager profile while still not having to maintain lager temperatures. Um, and again, with the the pre-prohibition porter, we want to shoot for something a little bit more clean and a little bit more uh, timid in terms of uh, yeast profile, so we didn't want to go with anything that was going to bring out too much of a really heavy malt backbone or anything like that. 
And do you have anything to add about the, uh, just the development of the beer and, and things you guys took into consideration? Yeah, no, uh, Richard got it exactly right. This was, <laughs> um, we started kicking around this idea with um, General George Washington's beer and uh, that we were seeing on all these forums that everyone who's made it hated it. Uh, it was really just uh, <laughs> to keep the troops hydrated and a little bit happy. You know, it, it had um, some good preservatives in it, you know, as a beer would, but um, it just didn't have any good flavors, what everybody was saying. So then we looked at that and we mashed it up with um, also a, a recipe from a famous beer diary, sorry about that, um, from Benjamin Franklin. And so uh, also a pre-prohibition uh, style. And we kind of uh, put the two different recipes together, uh, combining some aspects that will make the beer better for everybody, just a little more enjoyable, but also uh, stay true to those roots. Um, we, we came up with this uh, idea. I was talking about um, steam beer with Richard and uh, reading about some of the early days in California and some of the first California beers that were made. Uh, they were using yeast that acted like a uh, lager yeast, uh, yet were still in ale because they had no temperature control, like Richard mentioned. So uh, that's kind of how we came across this one, kind of how we came to the, the whole idea with the, the recipe in general, using that molasses like George Washington did, but also using the corn like Benjamin Franklin and kind of putting together something that was the best of both worlds. And I think that's a pretty interesting approach, right? Because when we're the first brewery that I actually worked at was a small historical beer themed nano brewery. And interestingly enough, it's pretty difficult to get those historic styles accurate with available ingredients that we have today and to where they're drinkable. Uh, because, you know, people look at these old world beer styles um, that have date, dated back 500 years, you know, say you're looking at some of these Trappist or monastery beers. Well, a lot of those beers that we know today are a very recent representation of those styles. Uh, Belgian triple wasn't really brought to the market until the 1930s. And a reason that we kind of look at it through the, the lens of history and uh, through rose colored glasses a little bit is but they most likely weren't very good. So it doesn't surprise me to hear that most people were saying, you know, this beer is not very good. Um, you know, when, when you're mentioned um, having the beer for the troops, right? It's likely that the attenuation was really, really poor on beers back then. And they might've only been two, 3% and had a lot of um, residual carbohydrates and unfermentables because they weren't regulating their mash temperature. They were using uh, their grist was, you know, for all intents and purposes, garbage. It was whatever they had available. Uh, and they really didn't know anything about yeast handling. So it might have been good to sustain troops because it had a, a lot of sugars available and not much alcohol, but it probably didn't taste very good. So it's, it's cool to see that you guys took that into account. What, uh, when you, when you guys were developing the grist, um, what are, maybe some tips and tricks that our, our listeners today could take into account if say they can't find molasses or um, their homebrew store, you know, might have limited ingredients right now with everything going on. What are some, some cool approaches or even alternative yeast strains that people could be looking at? Um, so one thing I did want to bring up, and that is a great point. Um, if you are not able to find molasses, one thing Ian and I were, discussing as a good alternative was maybe to take this recipe and sub out the molasses and the black malt um, and sub in a pound or a pound and a half of chocolate rye, if that's accessible. Um, I think that you'll get some good uh, peppery notes, a little bit of, of, you know, dark roastiness from that chocolate rye. And I think that would kind of be comparable to that uh, flavor that you're going to get from the finished product out of the molasses. Um, the other uh, yeast strain that we had talked about doing was 036. Um, so the Dusseldorf alt yeast, um, that's going to be clean um, still going to be a little malty, uh, so you're not really going to get any of that hop accentuation out of that. Um, sorry, I'm trying to read these questions and answers as they pop up. So I do see a couple people asking about um, temps for fermenting. Um, with the Otoni 9, we would normally recommend mid to high 60s, so about 65 to, say, 69. 
Um, I think if you stay a little under that or a little over that, you're not going to have any issue with this beer. Um, again, one of the big reasons for picking 029 as the recommended strain is that, you know, you have a lot of wiggle room with that, that strain. It's not really going to alter the, the final product too much um, if you go a little over or under those, those uh, targeted temperatures. Yeah, and, you know, looking at it, initially looking at that recipe, I thought it was interesting that you're suggesting to, you know, German strains, but it, it makes a lot of sense when you're looking at historical beer styles, because again, going back to what um, ingredients were available, right? If you're talking about the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was a lot of lager producers in the U.S., and so it's likely that they're going to use what yeast strain they have in-house, right? They're, they're going to use those available ingredients and kind of tweak that. Uh, fortunately, you know, being white labs and having a, a couple R&D breweries, we get to mess with a lot of unique yeast strains. So it, it would be cool once uh, brewery operations get back up and running, or maybe something Ian and some home brewers on here, some additional home brewers on here could do, uh, would be to take more unique strains to do it in the Colts next to an English strain. Um, Ian, do you have any uh, fun suggestions or yeast strains that you like working with in-house that might fit this recipe as well? well that's a great question. Um, I, I'm really happy with the ones that Richard suggested. I think those are really going to kind of nail it. Um, there are some Marzen yeasts that um, ha have some of those similar characteristics. Um, you could probably try something like that, but um, at the brewery, uh, we've done a double IPA with spruce tips, which were a common bittering agent back in the day. So, you know, you could play with those yeasts or you could play with the, um, your bittering agents about your hops uh, for a little bit of spruce tips, um, which could be fun. It's a make or break beer. You either you love that taste or you think it tastes like a pine tree, but um, it'd be another fun thing to play with. So Ian, you know, you talk about at your brewery, the different beers and and obviously with the smaller system you were talking about some of the unique beers that you do so like what other strains do, and what you know do you like that can produce like a wide variety of beers oh um well i mean you got your california 01 which is just perfect for everything um so i would use that um can you see me again I had an issue there. Um, yeah, it looks good. Uh, so, uh, California 01, it's great for everything. Um, breweries here in Cleveland, we, we chat and share that from time to time. Um, gets the job done. Kind of depends what you want. Uh, versatility, you might find more in like a Belgian yeast um, because of those ester profiles and things that they can uh, belt out and kind of work to any different style. Um, but it, it just really kind of depends on what's on the plate, what's on the calendar, what am I doing next? Um, so maybe Belgian styles would be the next kind of new strain that I would be shooting for. I'm sure Richard can speak a little better to the zero number um, than I can. <laughs> yeah, I'm, a, I'm personally a, a big fan on the, the Kvike train. So I did a, a, a black IPA. Uh, I wanted an IPA, my brother and father-in-law who don't prefer darker beers. So I kind of met in the middle, did a, a roastier black IPA with uh, 518, our, our Kvike strain. And that was probably November. I was extremely unhappy with it because I'm very critical of anything that I produce. Uh, but we opened up the last bottle last weekend and I, I was pleasantly surprised. We inoculated that one at 90 degrees and uh, let it ride, you know, at the tail end of summer. And I was still thought it was pretty amazing. So I think, you know, talking about the limitations of different temperature ranges, like you guys are mentioning, uh, there are opportunities and other strains that I think you get pretty close uh, by using some of the, the trendier Kvike strains. Yeah, I, it's great you mentioned that. Uh, I played a lot with Kvike at the brewery. Uh, it does do a lot and it does it quick, which is what I love. Uh, you know, with that faster fermentation, it's more anaerobic. It gets the job done in a matter of days. You can go start to finish um, I've done a chocolate porter with Kvike that I did uh, start to finish in a weekend. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and we can obviously turn this into <laughs> a Kvike conversation for days, and I'm sure everybody would be 
happy with it. But what's interesting is, you know, people talk about how fast those beers ferment with those types of yeast strains. And it's very indicative of those yeast strains, but you could ferment a lot of different ale strains at those temperatures and produce a very quick beer. It's just very rare that you're going to do it with a uh, very awesome. low ester and fusel profile. So I, I think they're a good substitute as we start coming into spring and summer for even historic beer styles outside of traditional Quebec beers. Uh, Richard, do you have anything else? Um, any cool other beers coming down the pipeline in uh in Asheville, I know you you tend to do a lot of adjunct beers, which I give you a hard yeah. time for. <laughs> um, unfortunately, right now, we don't really have anything planned with uh, everything being so unsure. But I guess actually just to t tack on the uh, the Kvike strain real quick, we are going to be doing some trials with um, some up and coming blends that we're looking to play around with. Um, hoping to maybe make a couple Kvike and Brett blends and kind of play around with those and just see what comes out. Um, so we have been playing a lot with those strains, but I think, you know, still trying to uh, figure out where to go next and when, you know, all this is going to be over, what we're going to start playing around with again, but you can be sure that it will have uh, food in it in some capacity. <laughs> yeah, and that actually brings up just a really interesting point because Ian, you know, you're at a you know two barrel small brew house. Richard, you're doing a lot of the R and D, and like even through this virtual collaboration, you know, how does that R and D thought process work? You know, I mean, obviously, Richard, you know, you're getting strains that may not be even released yet, right, to try. But like, you know, how do you decide what beers do we want to do? What beers do we want to try? Is it, you know, input from consumers? Is it internal? It'd be really interesting to hear both your thought process on really R&D in the back of your mind. Definitely. I guess uh, to hop in there first, um, as Eric was saying, he, he likes to give me a hard time, but really I like to, to push things as much as I can. Uh, so, you know, uh, I've got the, the title of food brewer. Uh, at White Labs, I, you know, as much fruit, uh, peppers, anything that I can throw into a beer and really kind of play around with and see how it ferments out and how it affects the final product um, is something that I personally am very passionate about. Um, so in terms of just R&D brewing and really playing around, that's kind of the stuff that, that gets me excited. Um, and then obviously, you know, being with white labs, it's any up and coming vault strains that we may have or anything like that, you know, making sure that we know what we're putting out before, uh, we actually put it out there as well. So Ian, if you want to jump in and talk about kind of your process on your end. Yeah. Uh, I never really thought about it. It's just like a, a conscious stream of experience that kind of lends to what I do at and I'm a similar uh, brewer, Richard. I love brewing in any kind of adjunct. Like I said, traditional, but with a twist. You know, I love, we made, um, uh, we made some really good beers that had a little bit something extra. We did uh, a beer at our brewery. It was a collaboration with Hansa Brewing. Uh, they're a German brewery. And um, so we made um, a traditional German uh, Dunkelweizen, but we use in it, um, gosh, um, this is getting me, uh, roasted hazelnuts from the west side market um it was just like let's do this it's a great classic style so it'll fit kind of with what their brewery is doing but then uh you know give it give it something extra give people a reason to try that that beer so um just conversations so i mean uh home brewing club i'm a pro brewer so i get feedback at the brewery um people are telling us you know we want more sour beers we want a beer like this we want um you know even staff at the brewery says hey uh, I would love to do a beer for uh, baseball season. So we did um, a summer shandy with star fruit in it. Um, we had all-star week here in Cleveland last year. So that kind of pulled it all together right there. Um, you know, so we got another one coming up that is a piwo. It's an old recipe from Poland that was just discovered in like the bricks of an old building. And um, it's a 25 hour boil. And just the idea of it is exciting to, to try. You know, this will help me do that. Um, it's different from sitting on a burner or something. So magazines, people, brew club, customers, um, everyone around me just kind of influences. I made a huckleberry shandy for my wife and mother-in-law because they like huckleberries. So the world around me, you never know. Yeah. What, uh, 
you want to what jump are, into some of the questions I was going to say? Yeah, real quick. Yeah, what are some cool adjuncts or twists on this recipe um, that you guys would suggest? And then Joanne, where can everybody find this recipe? Yeah, you guys jump. The, the recipe can be found on the homepage of White Labs. If you go to White Labs News and go to National um, Beer Day, um, the press release at the very bottom is the link to the recipe. Um, it, the recipe should be available through all the retail, your retailers as well. So. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then uh, first thoughts, I guess, on adjuncts with this. Uh, one thing we had kind of discussed, which I wasn't really 100% sure about, is using um, brown sugar for fermentation as opposed to molasses, what those flavor profiles would end up being uh, comparatively. Um, so I don't know if anybody has the capability of doing side by side, but I think that would be something fun to play around with. Um, off the top of my head, personally, I like uh, a lot of, you know, especially with a darker bit, beer, maybe some like roasted chilies, ancho chilies, anything like that. Um, is always fun for a nice, subtle, like roasty flavor. Um, those would, would be the a, big two, I guess, off the top you, of my head. How do you suggest yeah. on different types of infusions? Are you um, steeping it? Are you throwing everything in fresh? Are you using puree? When it comes to a lot of fruit, um, one of the questions I believe is about strawberries specifically, uh, you know, something that is, is very hard to recreate an authentic flavor using natural fruit. What's your experience and take on that? Um, I'll hop in first, I guess. And then Ian, if you want to follow up with anything for me personally, I, I don't believe there's any, uh, alternative to just fresh fruit. Um, so normally if I'm going to fruit a beer, I prefer to buy fresh, um, blend it down, uh, usually just an immersion blender and try and blend it down into a puree as much as possible, bring it up to 170 and hold it just to pasteurize it and then throw it in in secondary um or alternatively you know if you're going for something a little bit higher gravity maybe doing half and half you buy bulk of let's say you know in this case strawberries uh puree it down put some into fermentation just to you know bump that gravity up add a little bit more fermentable sugar um and then reserve the other half of it same thing you know puree it down um and uh pasteurize it and throw it in in secondary just to get the flavor out of it Uh, yeah, to speak to those, uh, to that first one about other adjuncts to kind of play around with this recipe, I, I talked about the spruce tips, and those are great ideas, Richard. Um, also, um, you could try and uh, use maple syrup. Might have been uh, accessible for mental uh, back in the day. So I love beers with maple syrup in them, or even barrel aging it. I think could uh, be an interesting twist on this one. But for using adjuncts, yeah, Richard got that right. Uh, fresh fruit, uh, it's the way to do it. It's really hard to recreate those flavors, but there's other ways you can kind of build out that flavor profile. So if, if it's coming through a little bit lighter than you wanted, you can have support. So like strawberries, uh, Belma hops, uh, the Belma variety uh, is, you know, ha is said to have strawberry-like flavors to it. So I would look for something like that um, to try and build up that kind of flavor profile in the beer. There's also different yeast strains that will impart different kinds of things like, um, which one I've used, uh, so uh, I do a pineapple cider that is just apple juice and pineapple juice, uh, but to really kind of recreate that, there is a blend by another company that um, is said to have pineapple characteristics. So, you know, you can look for supporting flavors in your yeast, in your hops, um, and then, yeah, just you want to kind of, I usually freeze uh, any fresh fruits I use before I use them, um, and then, yeah, the, the procedures Richard mentioned will kind of Get those flavors in there and usually you want to use more than you expect but you don't want to overdo it so maybe if you can um use 75 percent of it and then if it's still not there go in a, a little bit more yeah and that's that's where steeping time obviously gets a little tricky and on on the homebrew scale it's you know generally at least my my personal experience is it kind of goes by week schedules right because it's sunday and i don't have time to to come back until Saturday, but maybe it's a, maybe it's a good time of the year with all this going on to be able to monitor a little bit more. Now uh, we've got a couple more minutes here, but we have some questions that I thought you guys could get to. So uh, the first one in line with the Kvike strains, uh, what are you guys thoughts on dry hopping temps? So it seems dropping temps to cooler ale temps 
to dry hop first, dry hopping at those high kvike temps. So essentially, you know, dry hopping at that 85 degrees up or more, you know, lower 60s or even longer temps. What, what are some differences you guys have seen with dry hopping at different temperatures and impact on the finished beer? Ian, you want to hop in first on this one or? Yeah. Oh, you want me to? Yeah, go for it. Oh, okay. So um, based on what I've read and, and in my experience, uh, the cooler the temperature of the solution, the better you can um, impart some oilier flavor. So if I were doing a beer with bacon or something and I wanted that flavor to come through, uh, I would uh, add it in secondary uh, while it's in a cold crash. Um, so you know, you probably have a little more experience with this than I, Richard, but uh, I personally would bring the temp down just to try and get um, some more of the, the aromas and, and flavors from the hop oil, but I could be totally wrong. Uh, I would actually, I would absolutely agree with that um, personally, and especially on, you know, larger tanks um, with, you know, glycol capabilities. I would prefer to wait till one or two points from terminal um, and then start crashing. So a little bit of residual fermentation going on um, and then dry hop as you're crashing down to your final crash temps. Um, so on the colder side, uh, just right before the end of um, fermentation is generally when I would prefer to dry hop. Now, whether or not that's to say that's the right time to do it is obviously uh, up to personal taste more than anything else, but that would be my recommendation for sure. And I uh, highly suggest this this book, the new IPA, if, if anybody hasn't read it. Um, while it's you know very recent, I, I don't recall if they talk about Kvike, dry hopping Kvike at all, but uh, I would highly recommend giving that a look, and it, it gives you information on almost everything you would want to know about hopping a beer. Um, well, I'm recommending books. I've got one as well. <laughs> You're going to one-up me on that one. I, am I? Uh, this is the book on yeast, and it was written by Chris White, your own Chris White, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, and Jamil Zane chef. Uh, I think we got to get that signed for you, Ian. <laughs> that would be cool. That would be cool. I keep this one on the shelf always handy, taking a look at it today. Uh, this question's for Richard, but um, we had somebody, so you mentioned food beers that you're making in Asheville. Uh, had your beet IPA. Can you describe the flavor characteristics? Uh, they thought it was pretty bitter and wondered if it was the kvike or the beets or... Uh... I will absolutely agree that it was probably pretty bitter. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was... Uh, we used 15 pounds of beet. Uh, we cubed them up and put them into the boil. Um, and just for anyone out there who wants to make a beet beer, I would recommend going at flame out um, at the earliest. Uh, boiling was probably not the best way to go. But yeah, I would say that most of that bitterness was imparted from the beets themselves. Um, that particular beer, we pitched 518 and we held fermentation in the low to mid 80s. Um, so I would say that in terms of the Kvike yeast itself, it was a fairly uh, neutral and clean fermentation. So most of that flavor came from those beets and then uh, late hop additions as well. Who the hell makes a beet IPA? Come on, Richard. Well, you know, that's the beauty of having a small enough system to where, you know, we all make mistakes sometimes, and I would rather <laughs> dump three barrels than 20. So, you know, sometimes you <laughs> have to go for it. Uh, I'm just giving you a hard time. <laughs> uh, I would think more logically it'd be like a Saison or something, you know, that's already a little bit earthy and herbal would, would yeah. play well with that. Yeah, beets are uh, definitely earthy, definitely bitter. Um, I've never played around with doing beets in secondary, so I would be interested in just seeing what kind of flavor you get from soaking it. But boiling, uh, we put it in with 10 minutes left, and that was way too much time in the boil, in my mm. opinion. So. Did you leave the skin on the beets, too, or did you peel them? Uh, we left it on because it was 15 I, I, pounds. And I don't know if that makes a difference. but I, It might. It, we, it might. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we had another question, uh, kind of related to the beets, I guess, but more in line of the strawberries. Uh, you know, usually if you're working with fresh fruit and strawberries, the color dissipates very quickly. So would you consider using something like hibiscus to add additional color to the beer if that's what you were going for? Um, I think you could. 
it would depend, you know, obviously you're going to get some flavor out of the hibiscus as well. Uh, one thing I've tried in secondary that I've actually had some decent success with is actually using just a very small amount of citric acid um, that just kind of helps as a preservative to keep the color. Um, flavor wise, I don't think it really makes a whole lot of a difference, but it will help retain some of those bright colors that you get from the fruit. Great. Yeah, so we're um, going to be wrapping it up here, but did you guys want to give any final comments on the historic porter recipe um, or maybe what people should do if they follow up and brew it? Any way they can let us know or any way they can expect to see it at one of your guys' breweries? Yeah, well, uh, if our brewery is open, you might see it there. I don't know when that's going to happen. Um, but I'm definitely uh, got my brew club making it. We're all doing uh, a little bit different. We've got some different uh, fermentation, temperature control. Um, so it'll be interesting to see all of our side by side. So I'll be able to to try it there, and uh, I'll try and share the results of how this goes and all that on my Instagram and Facebook. But um, yeah, I don't know. Are you gonna be able to offer it, Richard? Uh, so we are not going to be able to make it currently. Um, unfortunately right now, obviously, you know, the white labs kitchen and tap is closed, but there is some potential for us to try and throw it together, uh, depending on how quickly we can get back to white labs and get brewing again. Um, it's definitely something that I would like to make, um, sometime in the near future on the three barrel system. So we'll try and throw that together and make it happen. I guess, uh, Joanne can probably speak better to the social media side of it, but we will make sure to keep everybody posted on our end uh, when that does happen. Yeah, so Ian, you mentioned that people are brewing it um, out there in Ohio. So if anybody brews the recipe um, and they want to give us feedback, definitely we'll make sure that we get it posted up um, on social media um, about the recipe. Um, we're going to do some follow-up media on the story. And then in regards to brewing, um, when we get to the point where we are out of this crisis, the goal will be to get Ian to Kitchen and Tap to brew this together and then celebrate in person. Oh, wow. I'll make it happen. Wow, it's my first hearing of that. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. that is. that will be the ultimate goal. And, you know, I I personally just appreciate both of you guys from a brewing standpoint wanting to, to get together and do this. Um, I get the luxury of, of kind of sitting in the background from a business development side and putting all the pieces together, but very rarely do I get to really work with you guys on the brewing side. So this has been pretty fun for me too. So I really appreciate you guys doing this project for White Labs. And with that, we probably should conclude, but I want everybody to raise a glass because it is National Beer Day. And uh, thank you guys. You caught me on that one. I gotta fill oh. mine up real quick. Hold on. <laughs> guys. We're getting there. Yeah. All right. <laughs> So whatever you're drinking uh, online as well, cheers. Here's to National Beer Day and here's to the chance where we actually will all get to do this in person, hopefully someday soon. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, cheers. And cheers. if you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to respond to the, the email generated through Zoom. It goes to, to my email, efowler at whitelabs.com and I can pass it along to anybody on this, on this talk too. Cheers. Cheers. Awesome. Thank Cheers. you for the opportunity. It's just been a great experience. Uh, I can't wait to taste this beer. All right. We'll talk to everybody soon. Cheers.